message today. It's <laughs> kind of been <laughs> run the race, finish well, do it. I am a pack rat, and so what happens with pack rats is they store stuff <coughs> in various locations. <laughs> sometimes they know where stuff is, sometimes they don't. But I pulled out a piece of construction paper that had a beautiful testimony, which I'd like to read to you today. And the testimony, I think, fits in with our theme for today. This person writes, and this is a very personal uh, account of their life, God has provided solid family upbringing, solid education, Christian fellowship raised in the church, long-term job. Financial security in retirement. Strong support system. Family, friends, and in this case, wife. The big question is, what now? Need direction on, on how to finish my life. What should I be doing to please God and do what is the best way to live out my Christian faith? Well, what do you think? Wow. I mean, that's kind of setting the table, isn't it? So, for this person of faith, the realization comes now that I find myself in a very comfortable, well-situated retirement. What is the way ahead in my life? With the time remaining to me, what are the paths? What are the pathways? for me to serve God and to be part of God's plan for me. Now, I'm going to just note for myself, for me as your preacher for today, I do find myself asking the question, what areas of my life that are becoming clear at this stage of life? And by the way, I do enjoy quite a few of those provisions already, comfortable, retirement, well cared for, well loved. So this is the question. We get to ask the question, indeed, what does my, what does the next chapter look like in my life? So here's one of mine. Right now, I realize the importance of honoring my marriage, and in my case, learning the art of supporting my wife, Gretchen, in her ministry to care for, encourage, and support people who find themselves stuck in often unhealthy settings. What a wonderful switchover, in a sense, because all those years when I was pastor actively pastoring as the official person in the congregation, she was supporting me throughout. Now, I'm finding that she's kind of leading the way a bit, and I get to be supporting, and I understand some of the energy that's required to be a supportive person in that ministry. I also realized today, and what's become clear to me, is the importance of honoring my children and my grandchildren, making sure that I'm connecting with them, and knowing how to keep up with them, which in some ways is impossible. <laughs> their, lot, their lives move very rapidly, and my knowledge of technology being limited as it is, 
Sometimes I wonder, well, how do I get in touch? And what will they respond with? Is it email? Is it text? Is it? But I don't do all the other guys, the other <laughs> mediums. But I do think that maintaining a connection and celebrating the way in which our grandchildren minister to us, that's a lovely one. I got invited to take a trip with my granddaughter, who's being invited to consider rowing for a big university on the West Coast. And she asked me to go along with her and her dad. What a joy to be included. So part of us is to know and assist. Part of the, this is what's become clear to me in retirement, if you will. The importance of respite care, of being available when our son was going through a very long and protracted divorce and separation process, we were able to go and to be with him in person while he was a single parent or while he is a single parent. That responsibility of being able to be alongside people in their various crises. I'm thinking of a young friend now who's a pastor who's been caring for a daughter who is also suffering a health crisis. The amount of time and energy that's required in this case means that this friend of mine who's a pastor and his wife have been caring not just for their daughter who's been in this health crisis, but also for their family, her family. And I really want to lift up the importance of those of us who have the time, have the ability to travel, to be with people who find themselves in various situations that require in-person care. And that may sound, you know, it's obvious, but it's also a case of we have to ask ourselves, am I willing to give up my comfortable routine where I'm always able to get my three square meals a day, I'm able to go up to Burnett Park to play golf, to go swimming in the upper Onondaga pool, to have a great life, am I willing from time to time to break out of that comfortable lifestyle and do some things that may require a little more effort on my part. I think that's the challenge here today. The challenge is, with this country having as many retired people as we do, who are often comfortable in their retirement, we've got a wonderful pool of volunteers. But even better than that, We've got people who truly care about people and making sure that they are practicing the ministry that they've been given. And I want to just kind of stay on that and give uh, thanks for that. That is to say, we are people today who are looking to <laughs> looking to Paul as the person who demonstrated to us what it's like to finish well. Wouldn't all of us, if we had to really think about the end of our lives, what the finish line looks like for us? Have we thought about what the finish line looks like when person is approaching their last days. There's a wonderful and powerful book called Mortal Life. And the mortal life is written by a physician. And he's talking about his own experience with his dad. And what he's discovering that, quote, and the 
The book is called Being Mortal by Atul Gawande. And here's what he writes. Endings matter. Not just for the person, but perhaps even more for the ones left behind. Accepting that the person is at the end of their life, and here's the thing, who knows when the actual end of life occurs? What is that? What does it look like? My father, being wanting above all else, not having to wake up in the hospital with great pain. His greatest fear is that I would continue to, to suffer, not only in the pain of one's mental state, or physical state, but also in the pain of, one, of one's mental state. He pleads with his son, I don't want to suffer, do something. Finally, he does receive an injection of intravenous narcotic, but how much to give? To subside pain and bring some calm? This is what is done. The father says, I want to go home. And the doctor, the son writes, in a hospital built to ensure survival at all costs and unclear how to do otherwise, he understands his choices would never be his. Take me home. They decided to stop the oxygen and the antibiotics for pneumonia. Just don't have me linger. But here's the thing. The wife says, wait a minute. He may still have a little life left to live. When he was permitted to rise above the demands of his body, he took the opportunity for small pleasures greedily. He enjoyed certain foods, rice and curried string beans, split, split pea doll, shira, sweet dish from his youth. And during this little bit of time left, he talked to his grandchildren by phone. He sorted photos. He gave instructions to unfinished product projects. See, there's still even that short amount of life to live. What he wanted for his final lines of his story is peacefulness and the joy of even seeing photos of his grandchildren. That meant a great, great deal. So, what about our finish? Being able to finish well. Now, the tragedy is some people are taken in a moment of time. I'm describing a perfect situation where a person can come up to the time of death and they have this wonderful sense, I am now commending my spirit to the Lord. That is a beautiful finish. But we all know that people die in so many different ways and there's so many different circumstances. So the word to us even now is to say, Lord, help me now to be prepared for when this moment may come. And at the same time, there's this wonderful sense that, okay, this is, this is what I need to be about in the moment of death. And when the time comes so that my last act will be one of trusting commitment to the steadfast love, of God. Now, I don't want to leave us with a complete downer today, but I will say this. When a person is suddenly taken, and I'm referencing the fact that this person I had in mind had just retired 
after a courageous, courageous stint as a bishop in our church. His wife was desperately waiting for those years when they could be retired together. But he was taken the next day. <clears throat> no retirement years for, for them. Her anguish. No easy way around it. His going from this life to life eternal. Boom, he's there. So, which is all to say again that we are people that are in need of help when it comes to our being ready. And honestly, there is no perfect way to do this. Paul makes it sound like he'd done everything. He'd given himself over to this mission. He had given his very best. He had done everything that he now had the joy of passing the baton to the next generation. And I think that part of our retired status is something we need to look forward to. How do we pass the baton along to the next generation to make sure that they know that they are important to us and that can give them a pathway ahead? So I ask these things in Jesus' name. And all the people said, <clears throat>